Hello and welcome to Gotham Sound's newest live stream. Um, I am excited to be talking to field sound recording artist Watson Wu. Um, Watson, say hello to our audience, please. Hello, everyone. And uh, I'm very excited to be here on uh, Gotham Sound live stream. So, um, I, you know, first of all, I've followed you on social media and um, I have, I've heard your work and um, I, I am, it's, it's an honor to be talking to you and I'm really happy that you're sharing um, some of your stories and some of your techniques. Um, but I, I want to, before we get started, sort of um, back up a little bit and I guess let's, um, let's talk about what you do in the context of sound recording for picture in general. So, you know, like my background, I, um, I went to film school, I hung around a lot of um, filmmakers and directors and worked mainly on set during production. But I was always aware that there was a whole other army of people that also did sound for picture, recording sound for picture on location that didn't necessarily do it in sync with a camera. Um, is that, so tell me a little bit about uh, how that fits into what you do. Uh, what, I, what I've been doing is that um, I'm the guy they ask, uh, basically when a project is over, to gather the extreme sounds, whether it be uh, stunt cars, weapons, um, just things that are hard to get, things that uh, they need during post. So that's what I do. Now let me ask you a question. Uh, is that... How did you find extreme sounds, or did extreme sounds find you? Like, how did you come to specialize in extreme sounds? Um, it just happened. You know, I, I, I was asked. Um, you know, these guys were looking for extreme sounds that uh, they've asked a number of people. And I've asked friends and colleagues um, who own vehicles, who own weapons, so that I could test record them and uh, see if it's feasible. And so one job led to the other. And so that's what I'm being uh, called in for, for, for these kind of extreme sounds. So tell me some of the challenges involved in recording uh, extreme sounds. Um, you know, what, what sets it apart from, uh, you know, I guess give some examples of what an extreme sound might be and how that might be different than a sound that's not extreme. And yeah, talk about some of the challenges. Okay. Um, for example, um, if somebody has a film that has uh, loud American muscle cars, so um, I have a lot of contacts, people who own, people who build, modify muscle cars. So I would uh, find out which ones they want. And not far from me is a place where what I call my top secret road. <laughs> so that's where I take these cars to and allegedly do different kinds of speeds, different maneuvers. So uh, we don't always have to rent a racetrack. If we need to, we can. But of course the budget goes up. So if the budget is not really there, but we can only afford the car and me, that's where this top secret road comes in play. Uh-huh. And I'm always curious, um, you know, when I think of a muscle car, um, there's a, a specific sound that comes to my mind's ear in a way. Uh, is that, is it a challenge to capture that? I mean, is that different than just sticking a mic uh, out the window? Like, what are, what are some of the challenges? The car's going very fast. There's lots of different parts of the car that make noise, right? Yep. How do you get that, like, muscle car um, sound like that, that is in our head? And how, do, how is that separate from what it's like in, in reality. Okay. Well, the, the, there are so many challenges. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, the wind, direct wind hitting the mic. So I, I do quite a bit of testing where I um, put microphones in concealment in different areas. And, um, you know, there are so many areas on the car you put uh, mics in the rear. So when I'm recording cars, it could be anywhere from simple two channels up to eight channels, some, sometimes 10 channels. So I might throw three exhaust mics um, and maybe three more mics in the, in the engine and um, a few in the cab. 
So I do have to use different uh, creative ways to conceal the mics. Some things I can't reveal, they're, they're a trade secret. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, some I can. Um, so uh, my YouTube channel, you, you'll see me recording a 550 horsepower Jaguar. And that's one of the examples how I record cars. So I, I have shown some examples. And do you ever get the uh, a context, like the narrative context for how the car plays in, in and I guess we should also talk about um, the kind of media that you your sounds end up in. Um, so it's not just movies or, or film and TV, it's also video games as, as well. And, right. and standalone sound effects um, libraries, is that right? Yes, yes. And so when you record, um, Let's use the example of a car. Do you ever get a bigger narrative context of how it's going to play? Like, um, you know, uh, the movie Drive comes to mind or some other uh, movie where there's, you know, an intense story uh, going on. Do you just record the car flat and let somebody else figure it out? Or do you skew um, the, the recording of it in a way that, that helps it sit in the narrative sort of overall context? Okay. Well. Sometimes um, in a game where you have the main character or in a movie, you have the protagonist. So, so we th tend to throw in more microphones or, or microphones that, are, that give you that more beefy sound into that vehicle, more channels, so that you could be more creative with your mixing. So I have worked on projects where, uh, yes, we have to do a lot more for the main character. So, uh, in, like the movie Baby Driver, we've had to record a lot more uh, for the main uh, stunt scenes. So, we spent a lot more time, uh, a lot more takes to capture all the uh, essence. So, we've had um, specialized uh, sessions where uh, the stunt driver had to drive towards the camera and then do a 90 degree slide towards the camera. Mm -hmm. So, my assistant assigned me, James was standing outside with two mics, and the stunt driver said, well, I'm going to drive towards you and slide 90, mile, 90 degrees towards you, but not get any closer than this many feet. Uh -huh. Of course, James' eyes went really big. And, uh, but it's one, it's one thing for that. somebody to say that that's what they're going to do. It's another thing to be the guy holding the microphone while they're doing yep. it. Exactly, exactly. So when in doubt, throw the headphones off and run. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but you know, I've, I've been in racetracks where we got a little too close sometimes to the race car. I mean, these cars are going over 150, and that's extreme. And that's going to be very scary. I mean, as somebody that's accustomed to recording dialogue, the first thing that comes to mind is how do you deal with the, the huge sound pressure levels involved? Yeah. Well, I, I tend to like microphones that you can really pound, and they still work and sound great. And I always use my sound devices, uh, mixers with the recorders, so that whatever's coming in from the mics into the mixer, the mixer is going to control those loud sounds and then feed a clean source into the recorder. Mm -hmm. So um, that takes a lot of time to adjust until we get where we want it, and then we actually then you know record more. So we we tend to over record, so there's more than enough material for for the mixing. And are you recording at a straight 48K sample rate? Do you record at higher sample rates? I typically record at 96. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes for film and sound effects, they do want 48K. Uh -huh. But 96 but, gives you more um, uh, better frequency response? Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, more fidelity. If there are special moments, uh, maybe a slow motion scene, they would, they would do some creative pitching and uh, adding more plugins for the sounds, uh, that 96K, it's going to get retained that fidelity. Uh -huh. So that's why we do that. And of, co and of course, the, your microphone selection and of course the sound devices all have that kind of bandwidth. They're able to handle the you know, four, uh, 20 to 40K bandwidth. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Sometimes if it's louder or not, I actually have sure mic pads that I can engage negative 15, negative, up to negative 25 dB, mm -hmm. especially like a race car or, or a really, really loud gunshot. 
Yeah, let's talk about gunshots. There's some photos um, that we've seen of you with some fairly large caliber guns. Yeah. Um, what are some of the challenges in recording gunfire? They're always loud. Uh, <laughs> real loud or much, much louder. Yeah. And, you know, th there's, to, to my ear, um, there's the gunshot itself, but then there's also the report that goes with it, right? Which but, is, I mean, you're talking about a huge dynamic range. Yep. Um, how, how, what are some of the techniques that um, you use to maintain that dynamic range and capture that extreme? Um, again, that's, that's with testing. I, 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 if I get a new microphone, I want to know what it can do. Yeah. So I might, I might take it to the range with, and have a friend do the shooting for me, and I'll put the mic right really close, middle distance, far distance, different angles, and see what that mic can do. That way, later on with a, another recording job, should I bring that mic or not? You know, so there's a set of mics that are set aside for firearms, and there are a set of mics I do for vehicles, huh. et cetera. So, uh, do you, and do, do you mind sharing what some of those mic and model models are? Uh, brands, I could share the brands. Um, I, uh, I often use Sennheiser, Sennheiser shotgun, um, the MKH418S, uh -huh. MS stereo shotgun mic. That mic you could put it anywhere. I mean, you could put it this close to a firearm. You could put it 300 yards away. And it always sounds good. Let's let's talk about um, close to a firearm because one thing I always heard, almost like an urban legend, was you can snap the diaphragm if if uh, you know if you try and get too close to a gunshot with a m microphone, that the mm -hmm. sound pressure level will just snap that diaphragm and you're, you'll destroy your mic. Is that true in your experience? Has that ever happened to you? It has. It has. Huh. It, ha it happens with the the cheaper microphones. Uh huh. There are certain microphones I would never put close to a firearm. Um, Neumann, you know, I, I would never want to destroy a Neumann mic, which I haven't done, which I don't <laughs> want to do. Uh -huh. They're very expensive. Yeah. Um, uh, Sennheiser, they, they've always worked and never had one fail. Yeah, and that, and that 418, um, just as a, if I can switch into uh, kind of salesman mode, salesperson mode, the 418 sure. is a great microphone because it's the same size as a 416, but it gives you that extra side channel. Yep. Um, so all of the accessories, if you have a 416, they all work with the 418. Um, it's just a five pin instead of a three pin. Right. And yeah, I, I've had incredible success um, you know, recording music with it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, you know, like just an uh, acapella group. Um, okay. And you know, I could just put it in the middle. Yeah. So, I, anyways, I'm a huge fan of that microphone. I'm glad Good. glad to hear that it works for you too. Good. But uh, you. it's it's terrifying to think that it works so well with gunfire. Uh, oh, it's great. Um, uh, even for car passbys. Yeah. Our cars are doing uh, takeoffs, launches, uh, burnouts. Uh, the 418. It just it works. It works so well. Huh. So that that's actually one of my favorite microphones. That's always in my car, always going with me somewhere. Um, it just it works well. Yeah. You know, the, the people who made the Battlefield video game, when they do outdoor dialogue, they're using the 418S. Huh. Yeah. In interesting. That's great. Yeah. That's good. It's great, Mike. Do you, um, like I picture you always thinking about how to record stuff, like just sort of like you're, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, bolt upright, and like, I've got it. And then you, you have like a, another technique for recording. Is, it, is this something that you're really obsessed with? You are. You hit the nail on the head, and I do that. I, I will wake up at 3 and think about, hey, I should try this mic over here. Yeah. You know, it's always trying to improve the technique. So some, some things you find out by accident, uh, which is great. You know, so you, you should always test and see what else you can do. There are other ways. You know, there are always newer microphones being produced. So somebody says, hey, why are you recording firearms? There's so many of them, so many libraries. Well, there are always newer microphones, maybe a new model of a mixer or a recorder, and they'll make it sound different. So why not? How, um, you know, like a big challenge uh, 
for me as a production sound mixer is scenes where they're doing, um, you know, and it's blanks and it's ideally it's quarter loads. But even that, when they're doing quarter loads with dialogue, yeah. um, you know, without an agra, um, it just you end up. I end up sacrificing the gunshot. Maybe, you know, if if, uh, if I have time, I'll set up a dynamic mic somewhere just so that, you know, I just don't get a splat when they fire the blank. Yep. Um, but do you have any suggestions for a production sound mixer that's you know got to record some gunfire on set or blanks on set? Um, and without sort of going right into, you know, super uh, distortion on their digital recorder? Well, I, if you could bring maybe like a mix pre-D mm -hmm. sound devices mixer, um, very portable. And, uh, you, need, you know, if you, if you need more power, well, you could always power with two AA batteries. Yeah. So I, I do like that quite a bit. That complements with my 744. And is that because of the limiter in the mix? In the mix yes. Uh -huh. yes. So the limiter, when you engage it, uh, again, I could put the mic, some mics pretty close uh, to the ejection port of the firearm or pretty close to the muzzle and still capture a decent recording. So I would always have at least two different microphones. Um, another microphone I really like, it's the Rode NTG3. Mm -hmm. That mic, I've put as close as three inches next to a firearm. Wow. And it sounded great. You know, that, and that's that's below a thousand dollar microphone. That's a great deal. So if you if you were doing a dialogue and there were blanks involved, um, just have an NTG three with you. Or a send you know, feed, you know, plug it into a mix pre D and there you go. So there was extra two channels will give you some kind of decent recording. Interesting. And I see that you're a fan of the remote audio um, high noise headsets as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I cannot do what I do without those. How come? Um, um, they're made for you know, a high SPO. You could wear them. Um, you could. I could actually shoot my, uh, you know, go to the range and shoot on my own with those on, and monitor what I'm recording at the same time. If I'm wearing a standard headset like a Sony or uh, the, 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 the new, newish uh, Audio Technica, yeah. I'll have to be 40 feet away or more just to withstand the pain <laughs> coming into my ears. But with those remote audios, I get to sit anywhere. I like to be closer to the shooter so that I can direct what to do. You know, some people, they don't do well. They're, they 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 might go shoot at the range, but they, they learn to shoot and react right away. Whereas the more the professional for film and TV, they will shoot and wait till the report of the gunshot's gone. Then they will slowly release the trigger, which makes that little click sound. Mm -hmm. uh, that little click sound will be captured by all the microphones. So some guys, have the, I have to give them more directions than others. So that, that's interesting. I wonder if you could walk me through your process a little bit. Um, you know, because uh, you might be called up to um, uh, record the sound of gunshots, but there's a lot more going on in your mind. Like, I wonder if you could walk us through how you break down preparing for something like that and, and what are the sounds, some of the sounds, you know, where it might just say record gunfire are there other sounds that you're looking to record as well along with that? Right. Okay. Uh, the the British film I worked on called 71, about 1971 when the British Army and the IRA collided in Belfast. Uh -huh. And um, I was asked to record the gunshots for the film. And so I asked for some quick time videos of the gunshot scenes. So based on that, I was able to determine what perspectives I needed. So I needed close, medium, and far. So that's that's everything, I guess. And so I then planned um, how many channels, how many feet of cables do I need to bring. So based on that, I'll, I'll have microphones for close, for medium, and far, and uh, specify how many channels. So I do have plastic bins, see-through bins, that I'll throw everything in there. 
and I rented a large SUV and um, see how much space I could have uh, on the microphone stands. So I'll spend the whole day just to pack and repack hmm. for the session. So I rented the, uh, a, my favorite gun range uh, that allows me to rent the entire area on a weekday all for myself. So no other shooters from far away will leak into my recordings. Right. And so I was able to um, uh, determine what the angles are and put the mics uh, close, medium, far, and readjust as we do test firing um, to see uh, where we want the echo to be. So I do have mics that capture the initial crack, and I have the microphones that I could reach further to capture the medium perspective and mics I could capture in a super long perspective of the tail gun tails. Huh. So all, all those are just relevant to gunshots. Yeah. And, and sim similar process for cars, like, um, I don't know if they're an, <clears throat> an actual client of yours, but let's say Apple called you up to record their new self-driving car, uh, which we all know they're working on. Um, yeah. You know, what would some of the discussions be like? What would, what in your mind, like what would you be going for? Would it just be the engine? Would it just be the perspective outside? Some mixture of everything? I would do, I would do everything. You know, again, I like to over record just, just in case, uh, you know, we, we need more content to mix. So uh, definitely uh, for, for a car like that, I guess I'm assuming it's going to be an electric car uh -huh. or, or a hybrid. But I'm, I'm, for, with Apple, I'm going to assume it's going to be electric car, right. like, like a Tesla, which I did record recently. Uh -huh. uh, so I uh, put a mic uh, right by the driver, uh, maybe uh, right on the radio or on the display panel. Um, I would put um, maybe two or three mics right where the electronics are, the servo. Uh -huh. so for Tesla, uh, for one project I did, I put the mics at the rear um, and uh, right above where you could hear the servo sound. And uh, later on, jumped out and captured the external sounds um, with the 418. It was interesting that at where the wheel is, um, you do have some electronic sounds, like engaging driving uh, mm -hmm. versus uh, park. So all those electronic sounds verse, uh, uh, in conjunction with what's in the cab, what the driver hears, uh, what the passenger hears. So all those are essential um, to a car recording. So th those microphones are different from gunshots. Uh, those uh, microphones will have a limited proximity, almost like a vocal mic. Mm -hmm. When you, you're on stage, the lead singer has a vocal mic. If he's moving around, like certain singers are very entertaining, they will run around the stage and sing, and the mic will capture what's around them only, instead of picking up also the the drummer or the lead guitar player. Sure. So, so I do like those kind of short proximity mics, uh, cardioid, for car recordings. That way, you'll reject more wind noise, reject more noise from the road, um, the rumbling of the car. Interesting. I, before I move on to um, how you got involved, I just want to look and see if we have any questions um, from the audience. Uh, we have 23 people watching right now. Oh. Um, so hi, hi to everybody. Um, Hello. And so I, I guess I'm curious to know how you got into sound recording at all. How, how was this something you were always fascinated with? Uh, what, how did you get involved in it? I've, I've always loved sound, you know. I guess in every boy growing up, like, wow, you watched a cartoon, you see it's big explosion, the loud car driving by, the uh -huh. spaceship. Um, so I always loved the sounds. When I was growing up, uh, my father actually owned an arcade. And so I had a, my own key where I would open up the Pac-Man and give myself infinity of lives and then wow. play every day after school. It must have been school. very popular. That was fun. That was, fun. <laughs> that was great. Was Wait, where did you grow up? I was born in Taiwan. Uh-huh. So in, uh, uh, of, of the large uh, building we lived in, our first floor was our, was our business. So I uh, gave myself the key and, you know, 
play play these sounds. That uh, it was all music to my ears. That's great. You know, I, I went went to school for music, um, got good at it, and went with a scholarship. And actually wrote a lot of music, so I actually started with music, writing music. And somebody asked me, "Hey, uh, can you make sound effects?" I said, "Well, let me try. I already have some recorders. Uh, back then, I had um, mini disc recorder, uh-huh. had a dad. Uh, loved those things. They yeah. were fun. Yeah. Um, the dad was very fun. You, know, you could actually delete and start again. You could split the tracks or write on the recorder. It was just." Fun, you know, compared to, let me buy another tape. So yeah. Um, so I I made sound effects, got paid, and I'm thinking, you know, this is fun. I mean, that, that was quick. I got out there, recorded those animal sounds, chopped it up, made it really clean, nice level, and sent it to the client, and I, I got paid for it. So that's where it got going. Where hey, um, this is profitable. I'm good at it. I have to, I have the gear. Why not? Let's keep going with making sound effects. And has um, has your music composing and your sound effects recording have they merged at all? Do they does one affect the other? Um, well, the sound effect has taken off more. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody says write a five in a piece of music, well, if if it's orchestral, that's a lot of instrumentation. Yeah. You know, it could take a lot more than a few days to write. A great five-minute piece, where sound effects. If they say we want fifty sounds of these, well, I could record a lot and make variations right away. So, um, you know, you, you do what you're good at and what's available around you. Again, you know, somebody like in you in New York, you may not be close to a top secret road. It could be two hundred miles away from you, or you have to use a racetrack. So that could be very, very expensive. So I could just drive 10 minutes, hop on my top secret road, and start recording in a very quiet area, very, very long. It's, it's like almost two miles long, so it's great. Amazing. The only thing that's bad is that uh, insects. So external sounds are a little harder to capture. I have to go somewhere else to capture the more openness without the insects and happy birds in the summertime. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, so it's based on your location. So, from my location in Southwest Florida, sound effects is uh, easier to record, um, quicker. Sure. That makes sense. Sure. Yeah, it's, it sounds um, more sort of instantly gratifying too. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, Jacob Cook um, says. Um, uh, Watson, big fan, what would be your default six-channel firearm recording template mics and positions? Uh, and then he's got a follow-up question afterwards. Okay. Wow. Well, um, again, the close-up shot, I guess the Rode and TG3. I do like the, some of the Shure KSM uh, condenser mics. Um, there's one that's a 141. It's got the rotating barrel where you can do uh, Omni and huh. you can switch it back to cardioid. Huh. So depending on where you are, you might want Omni to capture a lot more of the clean echo uh, gun tails. Um, sometimes uh, SM57, also really close to a firearm. Uh, middle distance, I like the, my SAS P, Crown Audio SAS P. Uh, BZM mic, and that's uh, right behind a shooter to get that nice stereo traveling sound. And distance, uh, distant uh, mics, uh, the 418S, the uh, Neumann 82i, uh, the Rode NTG8. Mm-hmm. Those are um, some of the uh, mics I could think of off my, off my top of my head. Uh, uh, good. And Jacob's follow-up question is, what are your strategies for capturing evocative material from tricky living subjects, um, such as a sea lion or a tiger? Have you recorded sea lions and tigers? I've recorded tigers. Uh-huh. Um, sea lions, uh, one day I'll do that. <laughs> uh-huh. um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose, like, waving a, a big zeppelin around in front of a tiger is probably not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, you know... Um, 
something also pretty extreme. I recorded chimpanzees and oh, orangutans. Huh. Huh. And so I'm thinking, you know, these creatures are six to eight times a little stronger than, than I am. Yeah. Um, no, I'm a big guy, but it doesn't matter. Those guys are stronger than I am. So I found a refuge in the middle of nowhere, Florida. So I called them and asked if I could put permission to check it out. I wanted to see how fortified these places are because if they get mad at me waving in Zeppelin in front of them, I want to see if I'm protected or not. Uh-huh. So this place had 40, 40 chimps. That's a lot. If you make one mad, they, they all get mad. Yeah. So, again, um, there are things that you could wave near them. Um, you know, again, I, I'd like the 418S mic. Another mic that's great is the Neumann RSM191. Yes. And that's, that's like the field recording mic. Um, the only thing that one doesn't do well is gunshots in very close distance. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, again, the 418, you can put it anywhere you want. And it sounds pretty good. So um, there are things you could do. The chimpanzees, they cannot stand snakes. So being creative, I brought some fake rubber snakes and made it around. But they didn't do anything. Uh-huh. They looked at me like, what is that? What is that? You know, I guess my creativeness didn't work out. <laughs> so what you can do is um, throw things up in the air. You could play back sounds of different creatures out loud. If you have a maybe a boombox, huh. uh, that you know the, each creature will react differently. So you you have to find something. Food, it's motivation. So I know tigers. If you weigh a big piece of steak, they're going to react. Yeah, gonna react. I'm sure yeah. they will. <laughs> exactly. And also the problem is that some of these animals are uh, housed together, so you might have to. Uh, get per special permission for them to isolate one so you can record one at a time. Um, uh, and, and hopefully you can move around the cage outside uh, so that they're not pawing at the cage at the same time as they're growling. Uh-huh. Things like that. Right, because any, anything that's not the animal is noise, basically. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right, so uh, Marcos uh, from Brazil asks... Um, uh, do you use some DPA lobs or shotguns um, for their high SPL and dynamic range? Um, so yeah, Marcus is asking about uh, using DPA lo- lobs at all. I do. I do. Uh, I do use them quite a bit, uh, especially for car recordings. Uh, most of the time in the engine compartment, mm-hmm. and sometimes if we have limited spaces on certain vehicles, like an, like an ATV, uh, motorcycle, I will also use the DPA near the exhaust just uh just to you know you don't have space so that's a little capsule could fit anywhere you want and they're great they capture a lot of lows in our high sbl great and, and presumably they're designed to be put close to musical instruments too so that same high sbl for that carries over to your to your work your what you need them to do exactly exactly um very cool i th- i think I think that's. I think we've gotten um, all the questions. Um, I I think we'll we'll sort of um, wrap up by. I'm going to ask you for what advice would you give to um, people starting out recording sound effects? I would, um, for example, recommend a little Tascam DR40 handheld recorder. And maybe uh, start off with a Rode NTG4 shotgun mic, and later on move on to maybe NTG3 or a stereo mic, and just uh, try recording common sound effects, doors opening, closing, so that you know how to deal with when, where to put the mic when you're opening and closing a large door. Um, you know, try to record little, you know, dogs, cats, uh, simple things. And maybe uh, maybe you have a friend with a loud car. Maybe try recording passbys, things like that. So and, uh, exp- experimenting. Exactly, experiment a lot. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, I, I don't recommend doing work for free. Uh, I would say you know you, you got to make some some money. So 
you could work for cheap first. I, I definitely don't recommend for free unless you know, it's an internship, which might be a good opportunity. Uh, in, yeah, interesting. I think internships that, that where you know you can benefit, you'll have some benefit from it. Yes. Um, is, is a good thing. Because there's a lot of internships out there where it's just exploitation. I'm always uh, wary of, I always make sure people are careful about that. Exactly. Um, Marcos, ha Marcos has another question. I think we kind of covered it, but he, he has actually, it's an interesting angle. So limiters, it, sounded, it sounds like um, the sound devices limiters are something that you're a fan of. But Marcos says, what about um, some of the newer, like dual A to D um, conversion technology, like, you know, employed in Sonosax or Zaxcoms, Neverclip. Um, okay. Is that something that you're, you're experimenting with at all that you, that you like? I've, I've tried them, uh -huh. um, and uh, I just, uh, from, from my experience, you know, my personally, uh, I, I like the sound devices, uh, the 442, uh, 744, um, 702, mix pre, USB pre 2. Um, I, think, I think they give each of the microphones more of their distinctive sounds. So I, I always say, Microphones are like ice cream flavors. You know, I like vanilla. And you like chocolate, <laughs> and uh, you need a lot of them, each each ones for an interesting mix. So, I think sound devices give a more truer sound, in my opinion, yeah. for each of the microphones to shine. So I might I might put two mics on and say, hey, that's definitely a Rode, and that's definitely a Sennheiser. Two different sounds, and that one over there is Neumann. It's one of the things I really love about this business is there's no one right way to do something. Exactly. They're all tools. Exactly. Um, the equipment are all tools. Um, yeah. So, and this, this is not, this is not, there's no segue here, but, um, uh, so that's advice for people starting out. What about advice for people um, that want to hire you or, um, you know, somebody that records sound effects. What advice would you give them? What information do you want from them? Apart from, a, you know, just the largest salary you've ever seen, what information can they give you that would make the job more useful? I want a lot of details. You know, if, if um, somebody gives me, uh, wants me, uh, you know, make a proposal for the job, I want more details. I want, I want them to put a shot list where the priorities on top. And I want to, I want so many details. I want five variations of that, ten of this, and I want on the bottom for optional, optional sounds that maybe maybe enhance the product. So, a lot more details than, than typical. So I, I want them to also do their homework, so that makes my job easier. So I could give you what you want and even more. Yeah. So um, if they they want six channels, I might just do eight. So that uh, you know, more is better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, and uh, we, ha we have time for one last question, I think, from the audience, which is: um, uh, When recording quiet sounds, what kind of signal to noise ratio do you try to go for? Um, you can easily record loud sounds with cheap gear, but quieter things are more challenging. Um, that's from Chris Tr Trevino. Um, uh, so what, what kind of signal-to-noise uh, ratio do you go for? Do you try and capture the entire sound in, in one recording? It's what I'm um, extrapolating from Chris's question. Or do you make one pass for the loud sound and one pass for the quieter sounds? H how does that um, work? If I'm doing, uh, for example, um, steady RPMs, mm -hmm. okay. while driving, we'll put the car in first gear. And let's say we're doing uh, low, medium, and high RPM, sustaining, sustaining, steady, while driving, uh, let's say, 10 seconds. So I'll, I'll keep pushing. So if I hit record on take one uh, for, let's say, high RPM, I want to hear what's it like in the middle and then push it up a little more. Um, sometimes uh, when, you, when, you know, especially, you know, People are not experienced uh, with, with sound devices. When you see the red, they're like, oh, it's clipping. Well, it's okay. It's, it's actually more what it sounds like than what you see. 
you know, uh, it, it's uh, your years. You know, we're in this sound business, entertainment business. So it's about what you hear. Does it sound good? Okay. Even though you see red, well, let's push it. Let's see how much we push. I mean, why not? We have unlimited power, unlimited memory cards. Let's push it. Let's keep going. There's still daylight. I love it. Uh, I love uh, it. So, so you push it. So you want to you want to see, hey, can I get that second red? Can I do red? Can I do even beyond that? So we've done recordings for like Need for Speed video game where we really pushed it. So when you look at the wave file in, in, uh, on your DAW, it's like, wow, that's a horrible looking wave file. It's almost like it's staying up there the whole time. Well, what does it sound like? You know, sometimes when you're using limiters, it looks horrible, but it sounds great. Yeah. So when a client sees it, they're like, whoa, what is that? But once they hit the space bar and play it, it's, wow, okay, I get it. One of one of the mixers that um, I trained under, I you know I was his third for a long time, and and actually he was my third, but really he was training me. Um, but he he tells a story, Larry Hoff, um, of recording sound effects for an Irish film that came into town. Um, he did the production sound, and they just wanted to get sounds of New York, so he spent a day recording sounds. He recorded um, a subway train, you know, like okay. the subway, the brakes, and that you pulls in, and then it takes off. And um, they called him up and they said, you know, it really, it doesn't work for us. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a technically perfect recording, but it just doesn't sound like what we experience in New York Subway to be. Wow. So he went back and he said he just pinned the needle. It was a Nagra. Pinned it, you know, okay. when he recorded it. Okay. And then gave in the tapes and uh, they said they loved it. Sounds exactly like a New York City subway. Ah, and it, it's a, it's, I think it's, it goes to exactly what you're saying, that you know, it really is about using your ears and does it sound like what it's supposed to be. That, you know, we don't look at the meter when we're watching the film or when we're listening. Does it yeah. sound like that? I, I think that's great, that's great advice. Good, good. yeah. So over-record um, captures, you know, the, captures subtlety as well as the extreme sounds. Because you, you're right, that sometimes we will over-record Things that the common person, non-audio people, may not hear. They, when they hear electric car, they might hear just the wind noise, mm -hmm. just just what they hear as a driver. You know, I don't think some people care what the wheel sounds like, but if it's there, record it anyway. But your your primary focus is, well, what do you want to hear in your product? Yeah, so, and it's it's something um, like I've always found it challenging to record uh, fires. Yeah. Um, you know, because there's so much going on. The crackle yeah. is so much louder than the whoosh. And yeah. how do you record one and not the other? Um, mm -hmm. And the other ch uh, challenging thing I get asked all the time is how do you record wind? Yeah. So um, I just wonder, uh, I know we're sort of going a little bit long, but if, if, you, can, if you have any suggestions or advice that I could give people uh, when they ask me, um, sure. I would be very grateful. Yeah, I, I worked on an indie film where... Uh, my friend was a sound editor. He said, uh, Watson, I need, I need sounds of fire. But I need fire in an oil drum. It's a very distinct sound. Fire, so I, sorry, I, fire in a, in a where? In a, in, in a, in a large barrel. Uh-huh, uh-huh. In a scene, you see, you see this person. Uh, it's almost like you get these bums warming their hands you know, in, a, in a barrel uh, with Got fire. It. Yep, uh, yep. They have a distinctive sound. So... Talking to a friend who does a lot of uh, camping, um, he likes to be in his backyard and warm himself during wintertime. You know, while he's fishing off the dock, he wants a fire right there. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, come on over. I'll, I'll go get some pine wood and throw them in there. I said, pine? He said, yeah. Pine, when you put them in there, it because the sap, it will break off. So it'll give you that, that, that snap sound. Huh. So, so him being not in the business... You know, um, he, he threw that idea in there. That was great. I wouldn't have never thought of that. And I thought you just put wood in there, maybe two by fours, and start a fire. Yeah. But doing that, it didn't give that nice sound as opposed to throwing the pine wood in there. So it was, it was great. Um, and, of course, I had to budget in uh, extra fur because <laughs> of the fire. That's right. Now, even though 418 could reach really far, I wanted even closer to get that really nice tight sound uh-huh it wasn't the quietest area you know there are people out there sure want to get really close and really tight 
for that mid mid channel. Yeah, but yeah. you sacrificed the fur. I did. I still have it, and still. <laughs> so if I'm not gonna take a picture of it, I'll use it. <laughs> huh. it still works. Uh, and wind? How would you record wind sounds? Um, wind. Uh, what you can do is, uh, of course, wait for a windy day. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to get to a place where uh, you want to get a shotgun mic um, at the bottom of the door and open the door enough where you're going to have some wind coming in. Mm -hmm. so that, that way you have control of how much wind is coming in and out by pushing and opening the door. So, again, it has to be a very windy day for you to do that. You hear that distinctive Hollywood wind sound. So there are some of the things like that. Uh, a large blanket you could move around, a uh, flag. So it depends on what kind of wind sound you want. So, um, again, a shotgun mic, so you can isolate that. Sure. Because a lot of times you'll hear tree leaves rustling. Sure. That's, what, that's from my experience with recording wind. Excellent. All right, I think on, on that note, that very ephemeral Zen note, um, we'll, we'll sign off. Um, will you stay with me just while I read some stuff about next week? Sure, no problem. Um, so next week, um, we are going to be demonstrating Sound Device's new firmware, um, which includes uh, wireless remote control and time code and metadata management. Um, as always, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, video archives are at Vimeo and YouTube, and please send ideas to info at gothamsound.com. Uh, Watson, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>